talk uh, in honor of our 195th anniversary of the founding of this church, I want to talk about our second installed pastor, the Reverend William Stanton Curtis. And at, like any good elementary school teacher, I brought stuff uh, for show and tell. And so I have brought a wonderful portrait of William Stanton Curtis and a wonderful portrait of his wife, Martha Leach Curtis. And they're the two people I'll be talking about as their lives and careers are intertwined in the history of this church and in the history of uh, uh, Protestantism in uh, the Middle West and New England. Um, and uh, I've also brought a picture of their son, whom I'm not going to talk very much about, but his name was Edward Lewis Curtis. He was born here while they were in Ann Arbor in 1853. He, like his father, went on to become a Presbyterian minister, and indeed uh, he became a biblical scholar and taught Old Testament at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago and then moved to teach the same subject at uh, Yale Divinity School in the East, where his father had gotten theological training. And I will also share with you one other show and tell item, because I'll be talking a little bit about the kids. But here is a picture of the three children. I'll let you, we'll pass it around. The three children who, uh, of uh, William Stanton and Martha Curtis, uh, who were born here in Ann Arbor. Uh, William, Edward, and their older sister, Mary. So this is uh, a little the bit of- The child version of this thing. Yes, the middle kid, who must be three or four or five, is uh, this guy when I think he was appointed to the Holmes professorship of Hebrew language and literature at Yale. And you're yes. descended from him. Uh, he is my great grandfather. Okay. He and she are my great great mm -hmm. grandparents through my grandmother's line, who was his oldest daughter. Uh, I was wondering which church building they were in. Was it the first one? The it was probably the second one but not the big one that this one replaced. The big one, if I recall, and they, maybe Beth knows this better than I do, um, the big one replaced, that, that this church replaced, was built in 1861, and it was a corner of Division and Huron or something like that. And it was a huge Gothic thing, and there are pictures in church historical documents, I think, of its being torn down. It was such a big church that it often hosted U of M commencements up through probably the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me say a little bit, actually quite a bit about the life and career of William Stanton Curtis. Um, okay. Let's say a bit about this. Um, I think it's safe to say if you look at the history of this church, that the college connection, the intimate connection between First Pres and the university really began with William Stanton Curtis. Uh, and as you'll see from his career subsequent to being here, uh, uh, higher ed was very important. Um, William Stanton Curtis came from a New England family. His father was a clockmaker. Uh, and lived in Farmington, Connecticut, and then moved uh, to Burlington, Vermont. He got tired of the clock making business and decided he would go west. And so <clears throat> shortly after uh, William Stanton Curtis was born, uh, probably around 1821, Curtis was born in 1815, uh, and <clears throat> decided he would move west, he'd, he'd go west, and they had we forget that the 1820s in places like Michigan, Missouri, or even Ohio and Illinois, it was wild and woolly. There were still Indians, there were wolves, and so on. And so William Stanton Curtis wrote a memoir with a lot of sort of 
scary stories, how he had to fend off timber wolves in Wisconsin when he was a kid, all of these uh, 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 kind of things that you read about or you read about in, uh, oh, you know, Laura Ingle, Ingalls Wilder books. Uh, uh, and that was his childhood. Well, the family finally ended up in uh, Hazel Green, Wisconsin, right over the Illinois border near Platteville, Wisconsin, where Lewis Curtis, the father of William, William Stanton Curtis, where Lewis Curtis became a very prosperous farmer. Uh, he was a farmer, and he wasn't interested in having either of his two kids, his two older sons, go to college, but both of them did, and they didn't have a lot of money, and William Stanton Curtis uh, lived over a general store in Galena, Illinois, uh, uh, camping out you know, in the attic in order to make enough money to pay to go to Knox College in Jackson, not Knox College, Illinois College in Jacksonville, Illinois, where he got his undergraduate work. After that, he went out to Yale, uh, to the Divinity School, and did three years of theological education uh, in New Haven. At that point, um, he was called for a brief pastorate to the first congregational church in uh, uh, Rockford, Illinois. And that, by the way, is where he met his wife, Martha Leach Curtis. Uh, anyway, he spent about a year in that pastorate, and then in 1842, as most of you know, he was called uh, to First Presbyterian Church, then called the Presbyterian Church of Ann Arbor. Uh, and in point of fact, uh, William Stanton Curtis is the second longest serving minister in the history of this church. Uh, there is only uh, one person. He served for 13 years, as did one other person in the 20th century, and, uh, uh, and the only other person in the 19th century was a person by the name of J. Mills Gelston, who was minister for 21 years from the 1880s to 1909. Uh, so he is a significant figure in uh, the, the church. Um, Chris? Yes? Did he, when he was in Galena, did he happen to meet uh, Ulysses Grant? No. I don't know why. There, at least there are no recollections of that. He was in Galena in the 1830s. That's, that, that's earlier than Grant. Yeah, that would have been earlier than Grant. Uh, anyway, uh, so why, uh, let me say a little bit about his career here, and, and I'll return to that uh, later. Um, he really built uh, this young uh, congregation, uh, and he, in 1851 and 1852 served as professor of moral philosophy at the university, really beginning the close connection between our uh, church and, and the University of Michigan. Uh, and so, and he was actually, for those of you who are, are Michiganders and uh, 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 MGO, uh, real Wolverines, uh, 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 he taught moral philosophy in 1851 to 1852, and he uh, was succeeded by President Tappan, who came and taught the same courses. Uh, Tappan came in in 1852 and taught them for quite a while. Interestingly enough, Tappan was himself a Presbyterian minister. Oh. He never really affiliated with our church, but he did occasionally supply the pulpit here during uh, William Stanton Curtis's years and subsequently. I think for political reasons, uh, Tappan thought it was a good idea to spread himself around the various churches in town, you know, and, and keep 
town gown relationships good. Bill? Um, I'll talk about it, it. The course content of moral philosophy had to do both with ethics, but also more especially with logic and the way things put, put together. I can show you a syllabus, not from that course, because we don't have the records, but a syllabus from a course he subsequently taught at uh, uh, Hamilton College in upstate New York. Uh, a course on the human will. And so it gets into sort of decision making and how the mind works, but it also, of course, gets you into sort of the borderlines of Calvinist theology. And is there free will or is there predestination? And I'm going to talk about the, some of the last sermons he preached uh, uh, by way of a kind of conclusion. So that's the general area. Uh, in which he taught. Um, anyway, uh, let me just give you the title of a talk he gave to student literary uh, societies uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, 1850. And this will also give you a sense of how he approached intellectual issues. Here's the... Uh, Title. The title is Tendency of the World Towards a New Organism Under Laws Universal and Absolute. And this is a long discussion in effect of the evolution of knowledge, and, and, but it's a very interesting uh, discussion because it's not really Calvinist. It's a kind of blend. Instead of saying we are all... Uh, uh, subject to original sin, and we don't know uh, about our salvation, sort of the heart of, of the, the all-powerful Calvinist God, he argues that the world is progressing, that knowledge is progressing on scientific and spiritual grounds. So he starts way back at, with the ancient Greeks, but demonstrates that the world is getting better. It's a very 19th century uh, uh, approach and not the kind of stern Calvinism that you would get, say, from the New England Puritans. So although he stuck with the Calvinism very much, uh, he, he, was, he was intellectual and he tailored his, he, he was open and progressive in a certain sense and he tailored tailored his talks at the university towards secular intellectual issues as opposed to uh, 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 the kind of, of uh, uh, preaching he might have given. And it's certainly as opposed to revivalism, which was not exactly the world's most intellectual thing. Um, let me just read you one long quote since you asked, Bill. Uh, He's talking about the progress of first knowledge how, and technology and everything. And he's talking about how we are much better. The only thing where we aren't better than the ancient Greeks is perhaps literature, uh, where you've got Sophocles and you've got Homer and so on. And that may never be equal. But the other stuff, technology, uh, science, biology, it's almost an evolutionary theory, but it's pre-evolutionary. So anyway. Uh, here is one of his quotations where he moves into the progress in religion. The purely, and this just will give you a sense of what a trip it will be to listen to one of his sermons, okay? The purely sectarian spirit, in its obnoxious sense, is being exorcised by the presence of an enlarged and liberal Christianity. Partition walls are crumbling. A common light is beginning to shine through crevices and openings. A common air is beginning to be breathed, and few have the heart to stop up the channels of a broad and free Christian intercourse. We confidently expect that Christianity, instead of being confined within, within denominational limits, will be expanded under laws as absolute and as comprehensive as the spiritual wants and the just affinities of our race. So in an interesting way, although he was very Presbyterian, he, he was really pretty open. It was a 
good place for him to be. Yes? What kind of backlash did he get? What kind of backlash did he get from this? From this preaching? From this yeah. talk? Uh-huh. No. Uh, the, the Undergraduate Literary Society wrote him a letter asking him to print it. Uh, uh, it's available in print copy at the Bentley Historical Library, if you'd like to look at it. Uh, so he didn't get backlash from this because he was, a, there were people to the right of him intellectually. And I'll talk a bit about two sermons from his last year a little later, but, uh, but you'll see. You'll see what's happening. <laughs> uh, so he didn't get much backlash. Um, okay. Um, we don't know a lot about his personal life here. Um, but uh, the big event during his ministry, of course, was the departure of 47 people to start the first congregational church. And I'll talk a little bit about that because those controversies haunted him in subsequent jobs. But anyway, we don't know a lot about his personal life, but I do want to share a recollection of one of his kids, the older brother of William, Stanton Curtis. Um, Two, uh, about their daily life here. Two stories throw a little light on uh, the Curtis's life in a country village, Ann Arbor. They kept a cow. Mother or the hired girl did the milking. Mother was sick, the hired girl away on leave, so father tried to milk the cow. <laughs> the Reverend William Stanton Curtis tried. Uh, but the cow objected to being milked by a strange man, and it was only when the Reverend Mr. Curtis had put on the hired girl's barn dress that he could get near the cow. It happened here. This is Ann Arbor in the 1850s, and this is the minister, the learned minister of one of the leading churches. Uh, in town, if not the leading, the first church in town. Okay, Um, in 1855, uh, they left Ann Arbor to go to Clinton, New York, where uh, William Stanton Curtis became uh, professor of moral philosophy and college pastor, college chaplain at Hamilton College. those were probably the happiest years of his life. He, he taught moral philosophy and whatever he taught as college chaplain. Uh, and they enjoyed living in Clinton, which was a nice upstate New York town, if those of you who might have been there. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and he had a lovely house there and And this is just a personal aside. We don't have a lot of personal stuff about him, but I I have gleaned it from either his son's recollections or his own diary of his childhood, which stops when he's about 11, so you don't get much uh, there. But anyway, uh, they had a large house that had orchards and gardens, and he cultivated the orchards, uh, and he grafted and raised trees, and there were pears and... Uh, peaches, and then they brought in Baldwin apples, and he used to go to agricultural shows, uh, which shows, uh, which uh, his son refers to, and I promised Ruth that I'd use this word, as pomological competitions, pomo fruit, fruit growing competition. I never had heard that word before I read it in the manuscript, but it's a... Apple and yes, and of course, palm and pomus. I think is la- apple in, in Latin too. Okay. So, so anyway, so he liked to grow things. He kept horses. Uh, he was he was a really a, 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 and he loved as a child and an adult to do fishing, hunting, and so on. So, although the you wouldn't know it from that passage I read, he was a real, in in many ways, a real nineteenth century man who had, with lots of boyhood and adulthood uh, sporting interest. Um, So anyway, uh, his preparation at Michigan obviously stood him in good stead, probably got uh, got the job at Hamilton College. Uh, And we have, we act, but to return to 
Bill's question. I actually have a Xerox, if I can find it, of student lecture notes from uh, William Stanton Curtis's course on the will. Okay. Uh, all right. This, these come from the Hamilton College archives. Uh, and it's some undergraduates who've taken it, but they're also interleaved are printed outlines of the courses, which are very detailed and totally in, inscrutable. They're treasures. Uh, and, uh, somebody dug them out of the, uh, 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 that's another story, the Hamilton uh, archives. But anyway, so there's this elaborate thing, Lectures on the Will by William S. Curtis, and then it says clear, and then underneath it in these little I'll send it around. In a little bracket, it says, clear as mud. <laughs> then, brief as the seven days of creation. <laughs> Comprehensive as uh, Webster's unabridged. <laughs> so you get the picture here? This was not, he wouldn't have given him high student evaluations. And polished as the tusks of a tiger described by the professor. Well, tigers don't have tusks. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll pass it around, and if you, you leaf through it, but it, it's a real keepsake, uh, and if you want to read the actual notes from the, oh, and the kids got bored, uh, just leaf through it, the kids got bored, uh, we'll run it this way, we'll start. Yes, yeah, several students, and I think the senior class, somebody took the out court, the outline notes, and they printed it up the way, I think, fraternities, uh, used to do uh, uh, lectures and so on. So anyway, OK. Um, we do have four or five commencement addresses given at Hamilton. Unlike Curtis's a Ann Arbor sermons, they're really very good and very thoughtful. They're detailed, but they really talk about what you should gain from a liberal education and the spiritual and intellectual and ethical gifts, and to set your goals on fostering and cultivating your character and your mind rather than immediately making money, uh, winning political office, or you know, uh, doing that kind of thing. And they're very nicely done. And apparently, he was uh, 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 very much beloved by his students at Hamilton. I again will read you a reminiscence from the older son, the one who's not in the three pictures. Um, I think this period was the richest in growth and the pleasantest period at Hamilton of father's life. His work as pastor and teacher was most congenial. He was much loved and respected by his students. For example, at the outbreak, of the Civil War, nearly one half of all the Hamilton students, it was a very abolitionist, pro-Union place, nearly one half of all the students at the college asked him to lead them as captain of their brigade or company wow. for the Civil War. He would gladly have done so, because he was a very active guy, but was rejected because of defective hearing. He'd lost, completely lost hearing, and it doesn't make sense to be hearing impaired when you're in the middle of a uh, old-fashioned 19th century Civil War battle. Okay, so Hamilton College was, was, I think, a great, it was sort of the peak of his life, but I think he prepared for that by being here. And it is said when he was minister at First Presbyterian Church, it is said that many, many students flocked to hear his sermons. Uh, our church membership didn't go up very much, but that's because we lost the whole, the entire membership of the Congregational Church in the middle of his uh, uh, pastorate. So, anyway. And were those people rebelling against him, or what? what no. Them to do that it, to it's them? complicated, and why don't I take uh, take the bull by the horns? Uh, and Beth had raised that issue. It's a very complicated period in church history. It was in the middle of the disputes between the so-called old school Presbyterians and the new school Presbyterians. Don't ask me to explain that because it's very complicated. Uh, so 
William Stanton Curtis was on the New School side. He had gone to Yale, which was the center of the New School, as opposed to Princeton, which was the center of the Old School. And so that cross-cut, uh, that rendered the church. But there was also the same problem that happened there was an agreement between the Congregationalists of New England and the Presbyterians of the Middle States that as we settled the West, they would both work together to found new churches. And that worked pretty well. And there's a lot of churches, Congregational and uh, uh, Presbyterian, founded in upstate New York, uh, Michigan, Ohio, uh, Illinois, and, and Wisconsin. All right. but. In 1837, the old school got control of the General Assembly, and they, without telling the Congregationalists, decided to abrogate the agreement and operate on their own as Presbyterians. But of course, those of you, and since my family comes from New England, when they're in New England, they're Congregationalists. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, there are things to be said for the congregational form of government uh, as opposed to the Presbyterian form. And so one of the things going on was the old school versus new school, all right? The other thing going on was the fallout from the, the uh, disappearance or abrogation of the plan of union. And then the third thing was abolitionism. Uh, Curtis is very clear that slavery is a total moral evil. He is less clear about what we should do about it. And people who really want it, and the Synod of Michigan and the Presbytery of Washtenaw were clearly almost rabidly anti-slavery. And in fact, the Michigan Anti-Slavery Society was founded very early, about 1832, well before Curtis's day, in this church by the Reverend John Cleveland, uh, who was the minister in Detroit, I believe. And there's, but, a, plaque on the and there's a plaque on the wall as you go out, uh, out the door there. Yeah. So that fed into it. But even those of us who are ordained elders in the PCUSA, and I'm only speaking to myself, sometimes get a little a anxious with all of the decently and in order stuff. And it's a little easier to run a congregational church in certain ways. I see a New Englander here, Mr. Parker, nodding his head. Uh, and loyal elder though I am and will remain, uh, you can see why people would fight the ref really in some ways the reformation was about not just theology but church polity okay so the, all of these things sort of cross cut in the departure of the congregations it looks but i have not gone through one of the sad things about the church speaking of documents pam um our church records before the 1870s are pretty much missing. So you really have to read the minutes of the Washtenaw Presbytery or the Synod of Michigan to figure out what's going on. I haven't done that. Uh, and those uh, are located here. I think those are in the Bentley. I think they're at the University of Michigan. Okay, so um, the educational career in 18... 68, no, 1850, in 18, uh, 60, no, it's 1863, my notes are wrong, in 1863, Curtis left this church, left Hamilton College to become the president of Knox College in Galesburg, as opposed to Galena, Illinois. Uh, and in many ways, he was a, a, a very, very fine uh, college president. Uh, but he came into this college at a very troubled time. It was the Civil War. There also was the failure of a major bank uh, in town, which caused a kind of local depression. And then in addition to that, uh, the 
college, because of the Civil War, was losing en enrollment. And uh, it, uh, 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 it had to sell at something of a loss some of the lands on which the college's endowment was based. So you had that. On top of that, however, the college was founded by abolitionist Presbyterians and Congregationalists from the Burnt Over District. Their first founder, the, the guy was named Gale. He was a Presbyterian, but he was very new school. He was very abolitionist. But the board was composed, the trustees were, it was composed roughly 50-50 of Congregationalists and Presbyterians. Curtis came in as a Presbyterian college president. He, he did pretty well as long as the Presbyterian majority held on the board of trustees. And, as, and his preaching and teaching were, as a college president, were, were not dogmatic Presbyterianism. They were very solid in his inaugural address, also available, by the way, at the Bentley, uh, and also on uh, Hathi Trust, if you, you go online through the Graduate Library, um, is it's not a religious document at all. It's a discussion of the ideal college and what needs to go into an education, what the facility should look like. I mean, he was a pretty good administrator and planner and manager, and he wanted to give a vision of the college. He didn't want to get into a fight over new school versus old school or a fight over uh, uh, congregational polity versus Presbyterian. However, these things did not make his life easier. He, he was, I think he and his wife were a very good presidential couple. And I'll just read you a tiny bit about his, if I can find it, yes, about their life at Knox and then go back to the, the, the topics I just was discussing, namely all of these cross-cutting problems and what happened to William Stanton Curtis that caused him to leave Knox College, all right. But here's just another one of the son's memoirs. Um, the five years that were spent in Galesburg at Knox College were very busy years for all of us, except, of course, Albert, who was too young. Father not only had the responsibility of the college with a fight on between religious factions among the trustees, but he was active in the local affairs. He was always active, even as a college president, in the local affairs of the local church, the Presbyterian church. During this time, and this is a tribute to him, during this time, the new and old school churches united in Galesburg, built a new meeting house, and called a new pastor. So he obviously was able to bring the two sides together as, you know, as a, an ordained member of that church. Mother managed a large house. that They had a big president's house that cost them $10,000 in 1865, bought at fire sale from the president of the failed bank who had to get out of town. But anyway, mother managed a large house, governed her three boys, looked after the needs of a socially ambitious younger, uh, older daughter, and attended to the social duties of a college president's wife. These, these social calls were not light. For example, this was a time when New Year's calls were popular. You went and left your card at people's houses. Twice the girl, twice the girls of Mary's class at the female division of Knox College received at our house. Uh, once, I remember, there were 110 New Year's Day callers, and each was, of course, served with a lunch. So it wasn't easy to be the president's wife or the minister's wife back then. OK. Back to the theological uh, disputes. Um, anyway, Curtis wandered, was conservative. He wandered into this situation as a Presbyterian. The Congregationalists got control uh, with their faculty allies of the Board of Trustees. And the faculty allies did not like William Stanton Curtis. And I haven't done the research to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And William Stanton Curtis also 
he was, by the time of the Civil War, obviously an ardent abolitionist and anti-slavery person. Uh, but he was somebody who did not believe in complete co-education. And the female students and the male fellow students would like to have had more co-educational co courses, you know, sharing the classes between uh, the, the, the women's division and the men's division. And the, and the head, the principal of the female seminary, I think is what they called it, same name as Mount Holyoke uh, originally, uh, the, the president of the female seminary asked had to prepare a report and asked William Stanton Curtis to bring some documents from the president's office to her office. She, so he then gave her the documents and then he tried to take them away from her forcibly to return them to his office. Uh, that either, according to the family, was a put-up job or, according to the principal, was a, a version of, of sexual harassment. Not, not sexual harassment, gender harassment, uh, rough treatment. Uh, there, there's nothing, uh, nothing sexual here, but it was not the way to treat the lady. And, and she was a fairly accomplished woman who apparently became the first female president of Wellesley College. Uh -huh. Uh, I couldn't. I can't remember her name now. Well, anyway, the students were upset because he opposed co-education, and so they staged in 1868 a set-in. They refused <laughs> to go to classes, and they did that for two days. Finally, William Stan Curtis decided uh, maybe the best thing to do was to resign, and so he negotiated a settlement where he was paid for the entire calendar year, uh, and the board of trustee chair, <laughs> I guess we know more about this than we'd like to know in Michigan. <laughs> I came out here and I thought, oh, this is a really calm place. We have a wonderful Robin Fleming who was in this church when Ruth and I joined. Uh, but yeah, well, that was, anyway. Uh, <laughs> and so, so, um, the board of trustees chair announced that President Curtis was going to step down, uh, and uh, and so Curtis had you know left. Um, but this, uh, in a way, uh, poisoned I think, uh, or really po uh, weakened the rest of of uh, his his life. Um, his uh, what the son says is. Um, This experience had a lasting effect on father's life and character. He never recovered quite all of his former self-confidence, and he seemed not to care for educational work thereafter. So he didn't leave a ruined man, but he did leave, I think, diminished and disappointed. After a year of supply preaching in various places, uh, and, and uh, he accepted a call to the Westminster Presbyterian Church of uh, Rockford, Illinois, where one of his wife's brothers already lived and where uh, uh, he had met in the Congregational Church uh, his wife years ago. And uh, he had a very happy pastorate there. He was much beloved and people really liked him. He was, and there's a story in one of his obituaries about he and his wife went to the Holy Land and traveled through Europe when he retired in 1875 as minister of the, of the church. And uh, a bunch of Rockford female seminary students, Rockford College, women's college, uh, a, a bunch of them were in Europe traveling and they ran into uh, William Stanton and Martha uh, Leach Curtis, and they just went, they basically went ape. They were so happy to see their pastor and so on and so forth. Because I think he really was a warm and moderate person, but he did fall on, and his theology was mm -mm, pretty rigid, but he did fall. This was the second time he encountered these various new school, old school, uh, and congregational versus Presbyterian uh, things. So perhaps he wasn't a, 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 a lucky man. Um, he did, however, end up 
Uh, in his Rockford days, I don't know if anybody knows Chicago Presbyterian history, but in 1874, there was a very famous heresy trial brought by a McCormick seminary professor by the name of Patton, who subsequently became the president of Princeton Theological Center, against another Presbyterian minister who was quite liberal in his uh, theological views, a pres uh, Presbyterian minister by the name of David, the Reverend David uh, Swing. Uh, and William Stanton Curtis was the foreman of the jury that found him not guilty of heresy. And obviously, Curtis's opinions had evolved, I think, to the point where he was very, very progressive. And this is a very progressive uh, theology, very much like the George MacDonald and the theology of the minister in 1873 here, which Jeanette will be telling you about uh, 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 next week. Anyway, so uh, Curtis died in 1885 uh, of, of a stroke. Uh, but his son, and Curtis, Curtis was on the board of trustees of McCormick Seminary, where his son ended up teaching Old Testament. He was also on the board of trustees of uh, Rockford College. So his son, Edward Lewis Curtis, the Old Testament scholar, met his wife, who was the daughter of another trustee of Rockford College and of the seminary. Uh, her name was Laura Elizabeth Ely. She was the daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of Presbyterian ministers, including uh, a moderator and stated clerk of the General Assembly in the 20s and 30s. So this family, uh, their children carried on that tradition and he even married into another Presbyterian clergy family. Um, a few words by way of conclusion about the kind of sermons you might hear in this church under the Reverend Dr. William Stanton. Curtis. Um, and I, I don't have time to talk about Martha Leach Curtis except to say two things about her, by the way, because I don't want to leave her unmentioned. One, as I was telling people earlier, she had a distinguished career where she was in, she died in 1910 at the home of Edward Lewis Curtis, but she was then the oldest living Mount Holyoke graduate. Not only was she in the first entering class and in the second graduating class, but she also stayed a year or two to be uh, a, a teacher under Mary Lyon, who was the founder of Mount Holyoke College and the, one of the leading figures in the United States women's higher education. And uh, anyway, and she had a full teaching career uh, before she married William Stanton Curtis, but she was a dynamo. She founded our Women's Association, then, of course, called the Ladies' Aid Society. She did a lot of good works here. She supported temperance movements. I have, but I can't find because it's in boxes and we're moving in the next month or two. Uh, I have a plaque from the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions thanking Mrs. Curtis and the ladies of First Presbyterian Church for a major like $30 or $40 gift to foreign missions and the mission work of the Presbyterian and Congregational Churches. So she, in, in some ways, I have reason to believe that she was the abler person of the couple and uh, <laughs> in many ways. And, and he was no slouch. Uh, a, a final word about his preaching. Uh, where I could go on for three hours, and the sermons average 23, 24 printed pages, but that's what people liked. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, let me leave you with a few thoughts. Curtis's sermons, and there are two of them from uh, his final months in Ann Arbor, I think a sort of swan sermon, uh, a swan song. They're highly intellectual. 
very learned and extremely involved uh, in their arguments. There really are philosophical disquisitions from the pulpit. Uh, and, but like, for example, the ending of this discourse before the literary societies, the student talk about the, the progress of knowledge that I was talking about earlier, they rise to or oratorical heights, and I think they can be quite eloquent if you like that kind of stuff, and most people did. Um, anyway, here is the title of the two sermons, also available in the Bentley Historical Library. Sermons on the providence of God as exhibited in the physical world and also on the certainty and freedom of human action. The first sermon is an elaborate attempt to justify, if not predestination, Calvinist ideas of providence, overruling providence, God in control of the universe. Uh, and it discusses how he controls world, the science, and so on. It's very elaborate and includes, goes, you know, includes four or five different theological theories, and it, it's quite learned. Uh, even in 1855, he was discussing the views of the German philosophers like Hegel and Fichte, uh, you know, stuff we still study now. Uh, this was not stuff that some guy baked, uh, you know, up by reading the book of Revelation backwards or something. It, it was, you know, it, 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 it was real intellectual goods, and it got him to uh, uh, clear his mud uh, to Hamilton College. Uh, the second sermon attempted, so it, it it shows, the first one shows how man, uh, uh, the second one shows how man, and obviously they use that in the gendered but inten uh, allegedly non-gendered sense, uh, shows how man has free will in spite of the controlling overarching providence of God. And that is an even, I think, more complex theological and intellectual task. Both of these sermons were published, I think, by grateful parishioners because they liked them so much and they were very sad to see their pastor go. And it's a di it was a different world. People liked to sit in whatever the church building was at the time for a sermon that went on for 45 minutes or an hour and that read like a... American Philosophical Association scholarly paper. That was our church, that's the intellectual history, and that of course is to some extent the history of American Reformed churches, Presbyterian especially, but also Congregationalist and, and Dutch uh, Reformed. Um, so he was a good man, a vigorous man, uh, uh, brought a good number of things to this church, and uh, uh, were, uh, I think we're better off uh, for him. I'm not sure I could sit through all the sermons. Um, I appreciate people interrupting this long harangue, and uh, if anybody has further questions or comments, delighted to talk about them. Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think he, you know, I have not read the minutes of the Washtenaw Presbytery, but it seemed to me that although that the breach that led to the Congregational Church was a big thing, I think these people were given letters of dismission, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, it was not, it, it wasn't, it didn't tear things apart yeah, in the way I that you, yeah. you might have uh, and the way that new school versus old school Presbyterianism did in some parishes. 
And I was sort of interested in the fact that although he went into an academic career for another 15 or 20 years after the 13 years here, I was sort of interested that both in uh, Clinton, New York, when he was at Hamilton College, and in Galesburg, Illinois, he was very active in the, in the local Presbyterian Church and was helpful to getting, helping them call new ministers and put things together. And he was a, the obituaries, there's a, an obituary notice from the clerk of the Presbytery in Illinois, in Rockford, saying how helpful he was and how genial he was and how he helped sort of moderate disputes uh, or, or step back and allow them to be solved. Oh, maybe the break between Presbyterian and Presbyterian here was more about church polity. How you go yes, church. I've never figured this out because the people who were more generally the new school Presbyterians who were the more revivalist and less starchy ones than the old school which came out of Philadelphia and they were all from, and, and the new school came out of New Haven, Yale, those people were, they were revivalists and new school, but they also tended to be abolitionists. But on the other hand, yeah, it, it was really off. I think you cannot, and this I learned both in Presbyterian churches and in Sunday school in the congregational UCC churches where I grew up, um, I think you cannot underestimate the problems that came when the old school basically welched on the plan for union, the, the collaborative work between the congregational and the uh, Presbyterian churches. And that was ultimately, I think, about polity. I'm not a church historian. And so in effect, all those places that had gone on as joint ventures the Presbyterians decide to get take them over and do them as if they're you know with Presbyterian uh, polity. But I have always been, and I certainly don't pass myself off as a church historian or a historian of any kind. I have always been puzzled by how the new school versus old school stuff works out. The old school, and it was in a general synod in 1837. Mm -hmm. And the new school came back uh, and tried to go to the general synod of 1838 and were not admitted. So for a long time, there were two general synods. They came back together again, I think, in the 70s. I'm, I'm foggy on that because I've always been confused now, about that. Were both groups abolitionist, or was that more of a new school thing? Um, that's hard to say. The, it, in the church, if you're talking scientific evolution, uh -huh. in the church, that battle was fought in the the 1870s and 80s. She it, said abolitionist. Oh, I'm abolition, I'm sorry. I, I'm, yeah. I, res, I, I like the fact that you're wearing a mask, okay? <laughs> and so I support <laughs> that. <laughs> the new school was supposed to be more likely to be abolitionists. They were the revivalists. Charles Grandison Finney, uh, Hiram Kellogg, there were a whole number of Presbyterian ministers from the burnt over district and a lot of them were out here and they were much more likely to be abolitionist. So it's hard to figure out what William Stanton Curtis's theological position was because he was trained in the headquarters of the new school and, and I think supported revivals but on the other end he certainly speaks of a need for personal faith, uh, 
conviction of sin, interest in religion in, in, in when he was six years old. There are a lot of signs in his early diary about where he was. So I've, I, I've had real... Uh, I'm kind of confused about him because he kind of... I am too, yeah. I had originally retired and planned actually to write an intellectual biography of the other Presbyterian branch of the family, of the guy who was the uh, uh, moderator and stated clerk of the General Assembly. So I hadn't done a lot of work on the Curtis family. I knew about the Curtis family because my grandmother was the granddaughter of this guy and the daughter of this guy and this guy uh, and that lady, of course, lived with my grandmother when she, after she graduated from college in, in New Haven. And so um, I was, I knew about this, but I didn't know the theological ins and outs. And at the time of the 175th uh, anniversary, where there's a very good history of the church done at that time, uh, largely under the superintendence of uh, Robert Warner, mm -hmm. uh, who was an elder and very active member of the, the church in the 70s. Um, it, it, it's very hard to know where he comes down. And I initially thought that the more recent history from the Linval era, the 100 and what, the 75th, as opposed to the 150th, uh, I thought they went a little too hard on Curtis's Calvinism, and I was reading the various things which he did in the university. And I said, "This guy's not a Calvinist. He's a, you know, he's a sort of a progressive uh, evolutionary thinker." But it's harder to tell where he comes down. I, I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting to the point where, well, maybe I better look into this and figure out this question, which, you know, it's probably a good, another good retirement project. Yeah, for the 200th anniversary. Yes, I, what the other thing is, if you really want to know the truth, I will be working on this for our real 200th anniversary. I'm not quite sure why we decided to do 190, 195, and 200, but um, fine, you know, we like it. Yeah, yeah, stay tuned for five years. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah. You know, all of George McDonald's personal correspondence is in the Yale archives. That's very interesting. He had hundreds, thousands of letters from his family and from friends. But Yale. How did they end up there? Maybe because he was closer to New School. And the Yale, in terms of biblical and literary criticism, and here I will bring back Edward Lewis Curtis. Edward Lewis Curtis left, was, was not unhappy. He liked McCormick, where he was, had endowed chair in Old Testament. But he left that at the point when William Rainey Harper, who was the professor, the Holmes professor of Old Testament at Yale, was plucked up by uh, Rockefeller to be the first president of the University of Chicago. Many of you may have seen that Rockefeller. There's a lot of money there and in the Riverside Church in New York City, all Rockefeller, all oil money. But anyway, uh, uh, but William Stanton Curtis's, uh, and there, there's interesting lectures on Old Testament studies and so on, scholarly stuff from his McCormick days. His role was basically to subject biblical texts to the same historical criticism that literary texts were. And so it was a philological thing, and it was, let's look at the historic context, let's look at the culture around it. It's the way we do biblical studies today. And Yale, when he went to Yale in 1891, he was following this guy who became the, the University of Chicago president, who also was one of those people uh, who who believed that the Bible was the word of God, but not in the sense that some 
guy wrote it in King James English in, you know, 4004 BC. Uh, uh, you remember the funny joke about the lady in Arkansas who says, why if the English of the, the King James Bible was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Anyway, so, uh, uh, it, anyway, it, it's an interesting thing, but I think the McDonald paper, yeah, it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Uh, well, thank you for all your questions. And uh, uh, let's see if we all, you know, if we last to uh, 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 um, uh, two, uh, the 200th, uh, perhaps I'll try to recreate uh, Curtis's interminable lectures on the will. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes.